To you and me, it seems obvious that we're conscious. So self-evident is it that we barely give it a second thought. But the question of what consciousness is has outfoxed every mind in history. Anaesthetists work on consciousness every day, knowing their drugs work in putting people to sleep. But even they haven't the faintest idea how consciousness gets switched on or off. You lose consciousness every single night, and feel it return every morning, again without a second thought. So what exactly is consciousness? Today in the Venkat Files, we try to answer this question. Before we do so, let us be specific. In this film, we are looking at the familiar state of wakeful consciousness. The subconscious deserves a program of its own on the Venkat Files. First, let's look at how we know whether something is conscious. The first clue we have that something is conscious is its tendency to do things spontaneously, things that inanimate objects can only do if struck by an external force. Take a kitten. It can look in your eyes. It can meow. It can take milk. And it can come to you and curl up on your lap. The key here is spontaneity. If you had to press a button before it did anything, you might be suspicious that what you're dealing with is a replica. So an organism is probably conscious if it takes spontaneous action of its own accord. This may in fact be the best clue for consciousness that we currently have. Another clue is if it sleeps. In order to lose wakeful consciousness and go to sleep, an animal probably had wakeful consciousness beforehand. With this in mind, let's take a look at different animals. Is a chimpanzee conscious? Well, it takes spontaneous action of its own volition, and it sleeps. It would be safe to say that, in all likelihood at least, it is conscious. How about a mouse? Spontaneous action? Yes. Sleep-wake cycles? Yes. Therefore conscious? To the best of our knowledge, yes. Now, how about a mosquito? It certainly isn't as intelligent as a chimp, but then neither was the mouse. A mosquito couldn't work out how to open doors or peel bananas the way a chimp can, but it does display spontaneous action, seemingly of its own volition, and it seems to sleep. The weight of evidence points to the mosquito indeed being conscious. And here is the important first distinction. Consciousness is not the same as intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to compute or perform complex tasks. The more you can do of this, the more intelligent you are. And generally, the bigger the brain, the more sophisticated an organism's computing power. Of course, you can outsource that computing power, that intelligence, to a handheld device. You're probably doing that right now. You can't, however, outsource your consciousness. All three animals display spontaneous action and they all seem to sleep. In fact, there is evidence for something at least resembling sleep in almost every animal ever studied. It seems, then, that in the animal kingdom, consciousness does not require a lot of brain. The pinpoint size brain of a mosquito will do. And we can go smaller. Much, much smaller. There's a creature you can find in great numbers crawling about in moss. One that's so small that ten could easily spread out on the back of a mosquito. An animal that displays exactly the same qualities of consciousness as its higher relatives. The tardigrade. And then there are creatures that are smaller still, showing the same clues to being conscious. So now we've taken the important step of separating consciousness from intelligence, and we've seen how little brain volume it takes for an organism to show all the evidence we need to call it conscious. But what are the mechanics of consciousness? How does it work? In order to find out, we need to do a thought experiment. Let's do it. Our subject is an imaginary organism called Pip. He has an eye and he can feel sensations through his skin. He also has a small brain with limited memory, with which he can think simple thoughts. In this experiment, we get to decide whether Pip is awake and conscious, or whether he's asleep and unconscious. We can also add or remove any of his sense organs, including parts of his brain. We begin with Pip wide awake. He can see and feel the ground beneath him. And in his mind, he can rerun memories of yesterday. He has a sense of the now, and he makes plans for tomorrow. Plans which are about to be ruined. Because we're going to take away his ability to feel. This leaves him with his sight and his thoughts. 
so let's take away his sight. Now all he can do is think. But now, just temporarily, let's remove most of his brain, leaving him with just enough to keep him alive. He has lost his memory, and he can no longer think. With no memory of the past and no capacity to think about the future, he exists instant to instant. His short-term memory and long-term memory have gone. But there's another form of memory that he will have also lost, one that's very rarely discussed. It's the memory of the previous instant, the one that comes immediately before this. By the time I've uttered these words, many, many instants will have passed us by. Instants are the shortest moments of time we can detect. In humans, this is very short. A drummer can detect a difference in the length of a beat of just a few milliseconds. But the actual length of an instant, as it relates to wakefulness, is probably much shorter. The information contained within an instant is likely so small that it requires very little storage space. Placed side by side with short-term memory, it would barely be visible. Like the difference between a mass storage device full of photos and a slip of paper with the letters ABC written on it. We can call this memory micro-memory, and it should be key to wakeful consciousness. Its small size would explain why very tiny creatures, with brains invisible to the naked eye, can still be conscious. Only a minuscule quantity of data needs to be stored and processed, and only for a moment. But what is the data that's stored in micro-memory? If you gave Pip a mouth and asked him if he was conscious in his current state, he wouldn't know, because to know he's conscious, he'd have to have a memory of having been conscious an instant ago. And he doesn't. It's as if each moment is isolated and self-contained. He's aware of only one frame of his wakeful mind at a time, which lasts only for that moment. The next moment brings with it a separate frame. He has no knowledge or memory of the previous frame, and no knowledge or anticipation of the next. If we now gave him back his sense of touch and poked him gently with a pin, there would be a pain signal, but that instant would be immediately forgotten and he would feel the pain of the next instant. The same would be true if we gave him back his eye. He might see a vase in front of him, but the next instant he would have no memory of the previous signal. He would never recognise the vase. The point is, the data that is collected into this ultra-short-term memory that we're calling micro-memory is a representation of time. Now let's create the definition of consciousness from everything we've said so far. Key to this is that to be awake, you need to be able to keep the memory of this instant as you move into the next. You also need just enough processing power to compare the two adjacent instants and identify them as being separate and distinct. The more serial instants you can hold in your mind at once, to compare and tell apart, the more awake you will be. You only need to hold a few frames at a time. As new instants arise, instants that are older than a few units into the past will drop out of your micro-memory, like a short conveyor belt of objects passing in front of your eyes, where you can see a changing series of objects. The control centre for this function in the brain will be very difficult to find. Different functions in the brain are held in different places, the breathing centre is located in the brainstem. Speech lies on the outer surface. Balance is in the cerebellum. There are good reasons why the micro-memory centre may never be found. Every time we wake up and ignite consciousness, we turn on lots of other functions at the same time, which gives rise to lots of brain activity. This would obscure the location of individual functions, including micro-memory. With all this in mind, the definition of consciousness can now be summarised in six short words. Awareness of the passage of time. That's it. This definition applies across every living species that exhibits spontaneous activity of its own volition. Note that organisms don't need to be self-aware to be conscious. That's a property of intelligence. They only need to be aware of the passage of time. This implicitly excludes all computer programmes and every AI in existence at least as far as we know. Because even if a clock is built into a computer program, it does not have a receptacle built in that could be a proxy for awareness of the passage of time. Which is not to say that one couldn't be built. It could, but it requires programmers of AI to be aware of the concept. If any large tech company is animating their AI with this feature, 
it will be very close indeed to creating genuine artificial consciousness. How do feelings fit into this definition? Elation, sadness, anger, inspiration and love are all hormone-related. Hormones come about in response to stimuli. They can be considered to be flavours of consciousness. If you remove hormones, you would not remove consciousness. You would just feel emotionally flat. For the definition to be taken to the next stage, we need to explore the concept of awareness, the subjective phenomenon of wakeful consciousness. When we say wakeful consciousness is awareness of the passage of time, what do we mean by the term awareness? The problem with a subjective experience is that it is exclusive to the person experiencing it. There's no way of experiencing it from someone else's perspective without becoming that person, which is impossible. It is more than just serial instance hitting a sensor, it's an experience felt by the owner of that sensor. One possible mechanism being explored by Roger Penrose is quantum changes within the microtubules inside the nervous system. But even this insight does not explain the subjective phenomenon. We're not questioning the mode of action of one process acting on another. We're asking, what is the subjective experience? We can only know if we get inside the mind of another and switch their awareness on and off while maintaining our own awareness. This is currently not possible, but it may become possible once minds can be uploaded onto a computer. It seems likely that consciousness or the awareness of the passage of time is an organic phenomenon. It does, after all, seem to reside inside the brain and nowhere else. Remember that by awareness, we're talking now about the subjective experience. When it comes to awareness itself, there's no reason to assume this is restricted to the brain or indeed to organic matter. Natural selection gives organisms with an environmental advantage the opportunity to live and breed. Striving to survive gives an organism an additional advantage. It can now consciously try to compete. Consciousness or the awareness of the passage of time would be essential for this and it was probably an evolutionary development that took place in the first complex organisms and got passed down the generations in the branches of life. But to develop the awareness of the passage of time, life probably took advantage of a pre-existing phenomenon that permeates non-organic matter, the basic unit of awareness that is present in the environment. This type of awareness of a single instant at a time, rather like Pip, has no memory of the previous instant, no ability to process an instant, no ability to compare two serial instants, and no ability to anticipate future instants. It could be a basic level of awareness that perhaps we experience during deep sleep. This may seem at first glance metaphysical or superstitious, but the most basic unit of awareness need not be. Every single atom of you is made of the stuff of stars, including exploders, supernovas, the stuff of the universe itself. You are universe, and in that sense, it would be accurate to say that the universe is, in a manner of speaking, aware and even conscious. So now we have a working definition of wakeful consciousness, which is awareness of the passage of time. We have the understanding, albeit a hypothetical one, that instants of time pass before a sensor in our brain in a conveyor belt fashion, and that there has to be just enough processing power to tell one instant from the next. And that processing power requirement is so small, even the smallest creature possesses it. We understand that brain size is an indicator of intelligence and not consciousness, and we have discussed awareness, which is potentially a more basic and fundamental concept than wakeful consciousness. It's the base on which the mechanics of consciousness are laid. It may be a phenomenon that organic life took advantage of to generate wakeful consciousness to help it get ahead. We also discussed that feelings are not consciousness, however exhilarating they are. The feeling of love is, for all its beauty, hormonal, and just adds a wonderful flavour to wakeful consciousness. As we have established, one thing that is not conscious is the YouTube algorithm. It is, however, highly intelligent. It knows to only present you with films like this if you like, subscribe and interact. I hope you enjoyed this film on consciousness and found it entertaining, and look forward to seeing you again on The Venkat Files.